Hey, what's up, guys? It's Michael from The Honest Youth Pastor, back for the third day of reviewing hashtag progressive Christian TikToks. And we're going to be looking at uh, one of the arguments that I've seen a lot lately, which is uh, the argument about 1946 and the word homosexuality being included in the Bible. Let's go. The original Greek word that was translated to mean homosexual shows up in two different verses, but it wasn't until 1946 that it was translated to mean that, and it first appeared in the Revised Standard Version. But that original word does not mean a homosexual man. It means pedophile, as in an older man who molests younger boys. And this is supported by the fact that in German translations, the verse reads, men shall not lie with young boys as he does with women, it is an abomination. Even in Martin Luther's translation from 1534, the word that was used literally translates to boy molester. Strangely enough, the first time the word homosexual appeared in German translations was in 1983, when American company Biblica paid for that version to be printed. The original Greek word does not refer to two same-sex people who are engaging in a consensual, physical, or romantic relationship. It is talking about child sexual abuse. All right, so there is the TikTok. Make sure you don't be a troll. Like, right? Be nice. Be good. So let's get into this discussion because I think there's a lot of information. I want to make this as short as possible uh, and to provide you with as many links as possible to further do that research yourself. I'm going to provide you with everything. Um, I think everything that I've looked at down in the link description below so you can kind of do your own research, right? Because you shouldn't just listen to me. So let's go through her TikTok here and kind of look at her argument and see what she says uh, and respond to it. The original Greek word that was translated to mean homosexual shows up in two different verses, but it wasn't until 1946 that it was translated to mean that, and it first appeared in the Revised Standard Version. But okay, so her first point is that uh, Arsene Nikoitai was not, uh, it's only in two verses within the Bible, which is true. Uh, the two verses are 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, and 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 10 as well. And Arsene Nikoitai is in both of those verses, and her argument here is something that I don't, again, uh, I know some people are like, it's a silver bullet. No, uh, her argument is that the word homosexual wasn't in the English translations until 1946. Uh, some people have taken this argument and really, really ran with it. Uh, I don't know if I'd put all my eggs in that basket because scholars have known that, right? If you watch any debates on LGBTQ+, uh, you know, gay marriage, uh, how that relates to the church, any of those, this will occasionally be brought up, but it's never a, like a, a, a pillar of, uh, you know, a strong pillar that hold, holds up their argument. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But no one disagrees with what she's saying, right? Arsene Koitai is used two places in scripture. We've talked about those. The first uh, time it w the word homosexuality was used in the Bible was 1946, the Revised Standard Version. So far, we're, this, is, this is right. This is factual. So let's keep going. Shows up in two different verses, but it wasn't until 1946 that it was translated to mean that, and it first appeared in the Revised Standard Version. But that original word does not mean a homosexual man. It means pedophile, as in an older man who molests younger boys. And okay, so her second argument is that, uh, that the word arsenikoitai uh, doesn't mean homosexual, which is act that's that's factual okay because it, when you're translating between languages uh there are certain languages that don't have a you know certain words right um there's a variety of examples of that even in modern day translations uh of books from whatever language to another language there's a lot of times where you have to use words that have the similar sense or the similar idea so that the readers in this in this other context and culture can understand what was being said. So the fact that uh, arsenikoitai doesn't equal homosexuality straight out word for word, again, t if you understand languages, you get that. Again, I'm not an expert. I don't know Greek. I don't know Hebrew, right? I'm not, I haven't taken those classes. But even if just a, a cursory glance at languages, you'll understand that that's how they work, right? You don't have to be an expert to understand that. Uh, now, where she's wrong here is that arsenikoitai uh, she claims that it means pedophile, which it doesn't. A literal translation of arsenikoitai uh, means man bed or man bedding. 
Uh, the idea, and we'll get into this a little bit later, is that it's connected to men in bed, right, doing things. There's a, there's an assumption here um, in every in every sense of what we're looking at. Now, uh, we'll get into kind of the the nuance of that here in a minute. But just so you know, arsenicoiti does not equal pedophile. It, it doesn't. It, it equals man bedding or man bed, right? So I just want to make sure that we understand that that this is not an act. Uh, it's not a factual statement. So let's keep going. It's younger boys, and this is supported by the fact that in German translations, the verse reads, "Men shall not lie with young boys as he does with women. It is an abomination." Even in Martin Luther's translation from 1534, the word that was used literally translates to boy molester. Straight. Okay, so this is why it's problematic to use, um, uh, to base everything you have on a, on a certain translation. Now, I'm not saying Martin Luther's translation is bad. I'm not saying that because, again, I'm not a linguist. But the idea here is that uh, the translations, even before Martin Luther's translations, uh, say man, uh, men sleeping with men. Uh, that was a translation. I'll include the link below for you. Um, 14 years before Martin Luther died, this was a translation that was out and about. <clears throat> now, the question does arise then, why did Martin Luther choose to use the word she's pointing out, which is pronounced Knabenschenda. Why did he choose to use that word uh, for Arnico uh, <clears throat> Why did he choose to use that word? Well, that word translated straight out does mean what she says it means, which is boy molester. Um, so there's there's a couple of things that we could look at here. One, Martin Luther felt like uh, looking at the context and the culture of the day that he feels like perhaps that uh, Paul was insinuating that this was an issue that was having to be dealt with. Now, on that note, in the same article that talks about the translations that were done before um, Martin Luther's death, uh, it also states that in other works that Martin Luther wrote or the things that he said, it was clear that Martin Luther's idea as he read through the whole Bible was that uh, God clearly has a, a set of standards and a, a natural design for how humans are to interact with one another, how marriage is supposed to look. Um, so the idea here that this word, he uses specific word, it's interesting. I'll give you that. It is very interesting, but it's not, um, again, to build your whole foundation and your argument on this would be problematic because there's, there's holes in the argument. You understand? I mean, there's as many holes in that as a plot hole in a movie. Um, so to say that arsenicoitai is translated as, um, uh, it's just problematic because, um, that also isn't a word for comparison. You're basing or she's basing her argument on the fact that Martin Luther translated that, you know, arsenicoitai to that. Um, so it's interesting, but again, there's a lot more around that than what she's stating. Not only, you know, uh, the word usage, but Martin Luther's other statements and how he translated and how other translators before him and after him translated that. Um, so again, this is interesting information, but you have to dig for it because if you don't dig for it, you're assuming that it all lines up here, which it clearly, it, it clearly doesn't. So let's keep going. Literally translates to boy molester. Strangely enough, the first time the word homosexual appeared in German translations was in 1983 when American company Biblica paid for that version to be printed. The so the idea here is that, and I don't know if she's saying this, but kind of her voice inflection sort of leans this way, that she's, uh, she thinks that there's some sort of conspiracy theory or some sort of uh, leaning that Biblica had to maybe push a some sort of propaganda uh, by by you know financing this translation now i don't know the hearts of those that were at biblica at the time but what i am saying is that we have to understand not only with translation committees and how they translate which we'll talk about here in just a minute but we also have to understand with you know bible distribution printing funding someone has to be behind these companies uh, doing that. Somebody has to fork up the money in order to get them printed, manufactured, distributed, and Biblica, Biblica did that for the re revised standard version. Was there, you know, some sort of behind this curtain thing going on? Um, well, 
you could say yes, you could say no. There's evidence. For, you know, I don't know if there's evidence for both. But the idea here is that to say like, ah, it's a conspiracy theory puts you in the same category of all the crazy other people about conspiracy theories. So I just be careful with that um, because that seems to be the leaning of many people, not all, but many people that I talk to that bring up this argument. They're like, ah, Biblica, they had this hidden agenda. Well, Okay, you don't know the hearts and minds of anybody. I don't know the hearts and minds of anybody. If they did, God help them, because that's not helpful at all. That's that's being untruthful. But um, one of the things that I think we can rest assured on is the fact that the RSV uh, translators uh, weren't basing their translation upon Martin Luther's translation. No translation committee would ever do that. They're going to look at other translations that have been done, uh, but all translations committees, as far as I'm aware of, and if I'm wrong, please tell me, but go back to the original manuscripts and say, okay, what is the Hebrew here? What is the Greek here? What is the sense that uh, you know is going on here that we can translate to make more sense to the modern day readers so they can get uh, again, not word for word, because that's sometimes there's not a word for word. But what can we do to get that that idea, that sense of what's being said? Uh, and then Biblica funded that for the Revised Standard Version. Let's uh, keep going. To be printed. The original Greek word does not refer to two same-sex people who are engaging in a consensual, physical, or romantic relationship. It is talking about child sexual abuse. Okay, so that is the TikTok. So the statement she makes here is that that word, right, arsenokoitai, isn't talking about two same-sex people in a um, in a. How does she word it here? Because I don't want to. I don't want to misspeak for her. I want to make sure that I say this right. She's saying that uh, arsenokoitai does not mean uh, or refer to same-sex people who are engaging in consensual, physical, or romantic relationships. Now, we have to understand a couple things. Um, uh, <laughs> arsenokoitai is very vague. Okay. So when we look at the word man bedding or men in bed with men, um, there are certain things that we can draw out from that culturally. Now, this is where the nuance comes in, right? This is, this is why I think that Martin Luther choose to use the word he did, because again, we've talked about this before context, uh, is important. Um, exe do, doing exegetical work, looking at those contexts is important. In fact, I would say this is very similar to um, to the, the women in leadership discussion in the sense that a lot of people, when they look at the first and second Timothy and they're talking about women in eldership and they'd be like, well, the context here is, you know, women in temple worship and all of this sort of thing. And so Paul's probably not talking about that. He's probably talking about the women need to submit because they're so used to being outspoken and they're bringing in false teaching. And therefore Paul's not saying women can't be elders. Um, so I, I find this argument to be similar in the sense that when we look at the context and culture, two things can be true at once in the sense that uh, Paul could have been talking about uh, pedophiles or boy molesters in the culture as well. But when he points back to Leviticus, He's specifically pointing back to uh, this idea that men with men uh, is an abomination. And he doesn't, he doesn't use specific words that he could have used in order to point to that as much as he uses an umbrella term uh, when he's talking about these things, much like he uses uh, an umbrella term in, in all the other situations, right? So when he's talking about adultery, uh, he, he talks about adultery. Now, could have Paul thought about, you know, a day and age in which we live, which, you know, there's swingers, right? Where this, this couple decides that I'm okay with you sleeping with other, somebody else because, you know, whatever, they, they've decided that. Um, did they have that in his time? I, I think there's biblical proof or extra biblical proof that that was a thing that was happening as well. Um, just like a lot of resources from uh, that research, the history during Paul's day would also say that uh, consensual homosexual relationships were not uncommon in Paul's day either. So the idea here is that, that Paul's aware of that, but he doesn't get into specifics as much as he does. Okay, this overarching idea goes against what God has taught us before, right? So adultery, regardless of how it looks like, is still bad, whether the, the man and wife decided that it was okay for them to sleep with other people, just like overarching idea here that uh, if we look back at God's, and I think this is again why, I think this is why Martin Luther used the word he did, because when we look at the overarching story within scripture, we see that God's design and plan is for a man and woman to represent uh, his relationship and his covenant 
uh, with his people out into the world and that that is his design. And when you start messing with that design, uh, it starts, well, it, it, it gets complicated and it gets sinful and it gets problematic. Um, so we could go into a whole lot more nuance than that, but we're looking specifically at this TikTok. So when you start hearing about the argument of 1946 and the word homosexuality being added to the Bible and it was not there until then, therefore, you know, you know, there's some conspiracy theory behind you. You have to understand language and translations and how that all works. Was the word homosexual in the Bible before 1946? As far as all the research I see, it's not, but there's a reason for that. It's because the translators before that uh, didn't have a, a, a sense in which to translate that over. And many of them just use men betting with men because everybody already knew what that meant, right? And it, they didn't need some label or term to do that. And in the cases such as Martin Luther, where other words are used, I think, again, the, Martin Luther took um, transitional liber, uh, translational liberty here and said exegetically, culturally, I see this happening. And he uses that word um, in, in those two particular passages. My point is that 1946 isn't some silver bullet that destroys the entire argument of LGBTQ and the church. Again, I would, I would urge you to watch the debates below, linked below, because these are all scholars that know the language of the time and are not phased by, on either side, the argument of the 1946 idea of homosexual being added to the Bible. Because the people that debate these sort of things, the people that know the original languages, know that translation and how people talk and literacy is a big deal and therefore needs to be looked at. Once again, guys, hopefully that was helpful. I'll talk to you later.